today's panel, America's Pacific Century, question mark. I want to underscore that question mark there. It's the title of the panel, U.S.-China Relations. My name is Tina Gerhardt. Um, I co-organized the panel, despite what the program says, more or less together, uh, with Lucia green Weiskel. And um, the order is going to be a little different than what's in the program today. Boma is going to speak first, and then I'm going to speak, then Lucia green Weiskel is going to speak, and then finally Michael Clare is going to speak. Um, Bo Ma is a PhD candidate at the CUNY Graduate Center, and he's currently writing his dissertation, which considers international relations theories and the rise of China. He received his master's degree from NYU and London School of Economics and Political Science, and his BA from Beijing Normal University in China. His articles have appeared in CEU, Political Science Journal, Journal of U.S. China Public Administration. Leaders Magazine and China Review Monthly. And his paper today is entitled China's Search for Peaceful Internationalism in a Liberal Internationalism World. Excuse me, what's, what, what is your name again, sir? Uh, Bo Ma. M.A.? Uh, yeah. Last name is M.A., yes. <laughs> it's in the program, too. It's on the next page. Uh -huh. Left form aligning. <laughs> An orphan. Mm -hmm. When I told my friend that I'm coming to this left forum for the first time, they say, when did you turn left? I said, well, since I, because my apartment is always on the left, or left side of the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so this is going to be uh, my uh, PhD dissertation titled uh, China's Search, for, uh, Search of Peaceful Internationalism Vis-a-vis -vis an American Liberal World Order. Okay. So we understand now we're living in this uh, world dominated by the U.S. power, but the U.S. was so benign, they always say, well, not like other great powers, we use our power for good, uh, for good wealth, so we are living in this liberal internationalism. Okay, so this is best for the world orders and bring, uh, bring stability and prosperity to the rest of the countries. But since the rise of China actually uh, did a little challenge of this, uh, as you can appear from this media, or even some politician was worried about this because of this size of China's economy and its non-democratic regimes. So the research question will be, will China's rise challenge the liberal international order? And also, is China a reformist power or revisionist challenger to Americans Premises. And then, um, what principles should inform Chinese foreign policy the way China deals with the rest of the world? Um, in international relation uh, series, I think uh, uh, the, the, there are at least three basic schools the realism, the neoliberalism, and also the constructivism. They all have their own theory uh, talking about China's rise and their perception. The realism, I categorize as a China threat school. Okay? Mainly their argument is a rising China will cause instability by threatening the existing system and dominant powers. Okay? So from that sense, China is not different than this uh, British, British Empire, this uh, Napoleon's France, this uh, Hitler's Germany or Stalin's Russian or even the US. So it will always seek to become the number one, even may potentially have a war with the US. It's because that's all rising, rising power do. Okay, so the US should be careful about this. Particularly scholar like Jiao Mearsheimer, um, uh, University of Chicago. Uh, in 2005, he wrote a piece called China's Unpeaceful Rise in the current history magazine. So he talked about China is not going to rise peacefully, despite he always say it's going to be peaceful, but it's impossible because every state wants to survive. Uh, we're not sure about their intentions, and they process this tremendous economic and potentially can be transferred to a military capacity. So even China now, the military is much smaller than us, but soon, they will develop their military power and will challenge us. So we should be careful about this. Um, so that's the realism perception about the rise of China. But they have their problem. First, they suffer this problem in theory. First, they focus too much on this geopolitics. 
but uh, ignore much of this geoeconomics, right? Because the 21st century is a century of uh, economics more important than others, okay? So the concept of security has been changed. Before, it was only military security, but now we have these economic securities, these environmental securities, and even human security, let's say, deal with the aids of global poverty. So those things are beyond this military capacity. Right? So that's one part in the theory. Okay. So this you can really cooperate with other powers. Second, they shot on these uh, empirical uh, examples. Uh, for the work has been done by David Kang at the University of South Car uh, California and uh, James Xiong at NYU. They're talking about China is not the first time rising power. So you cannot draw the analogy between China and th these previous great powers. Because from the 6th century to um, 1820, China was the largest country economy in the world. And then you look at their record back to these thousand years ago, they didn't really conquer other nations. They didn't conquer their neighbors, right? So David Kang found only three wars China had with the neighbors during those thousand years. Mm -hmm. One's with Japan and Vietnam, and uh, uh, a small war with uh, uh, Korea. So Mandarin is peaceful. You didn't see China actually conquer other countries back to them. Uh, also, even now, the professor called uh, of Fragwo at MIT, he conducted the China's border dispute with other neighboring countries. So his funding is among 22 <laughs> border dispute between China and neighboring country, China only used four seven types. So the, most of the time, China just talk with their neighbors. Um, so they shot down these empirical uh, examples. The second school uh, followed this neoliberalism. Um, I call them uh, the engagement school. They say, well, yes, China is rising, and uh, maybe sooner it will surpass all or become the largest economy. However, the rise <coughs> of China benefits from the current geoeconomic state of affairs, and China has followed the rules and norms established by the Western countries. So actually, we make the rules. So we make the UN, the Bretton Woods system. So China just become a player. <coughs> but even if the economy surpasses us, we still make the rule, and they follow our rules. So we shouldn't be terrified about them. So in that sense, China is a stakeholder rather than a challenge to the status quo of the current international system. That's probably, uh, at least you heard people from the White House are talking about the, the same thing. So China, we should we shouldn't be afraid of them. We should cooperate with them, engage with them. Eventually, they'll be like us. Okay. Uh, the Chinese scholars also say the same thing. They invent this term called peaceful rising. Okay. So, yes, we are rising, but we are peaceful, and we have a peaceful development policy, so don't be afraid of us. We will only bring goods to the international system. There are also problems on this perspective. This economic perspective doesn't fully explain why further integration <coughs> and engagement have not taken place. Right. For instance, if you're talking about you can engage China and become, play our rules, then how can you explain China refused to join this uh, group of seven, most industrialized country in the world? Russian didn't hesitate to join despite its economy size smaller than China. But China always said this is a rich country club. We're not going to join this. So, okay, but after uh, 2008 financial crisis, Obama proposed to the Chinese leader that let's form a group of two, right? So China and the U.S. together, we can dominate world affairs. But Chinese uh, once again refused that. So why the Chinese refuse to become the number two in the world? I think the Russian probably will do that, right? They believe in Yi Ching. Uh, right? <laughs> and also in this, uh, the territorial sovereignties. China always say, well, Tibet and Taiwan is part of us. We can even use force to defend our territory. Oh, on this issue on human rights, China is also very affirmative. Uh, so that's, that's the problem for this engagement school. So engagement only to a certain level, but not further. The last school followed the constructivism approach. 
uh, because they say the, the Western civilization is uh, so-called standards of civilization. So if we like beefs, we think everyone else in the world like beef, so we'll give them beefs. But this approach said uh, ideas and norms in international relations study, they matters, and they call for a return of the historical foundation um, of the East Asia and China in understanding the security behavior of a rising China. Because China is different, so for the thousand years in history, it, there, there's not anarchy, or oh, it's hierarchy. With China in the center, other countries just align with China, and China provides security to them. Right. So for the Chinese concept, the world is always have some center, and it's, it's, it's a hierarchy. Right. It's like a domestic uh, politics, but doesn't mean China's going to uh, bully the others small states, right? In fact, before the system was called tribute system, which means the smaller neighbors gave tribute to China and the Chinese emperor always returned a, a bigger a gift to them. So this system is stable. And uh, if the Chinese has that mentality, they wouldn't mind to become a uh, bad wagoning with the US. They can tolerate the US in the top because the US provides security and peace. So China was quite happy about this. That's the third school, but they also have their problem because they gave insufficient attention to change in China's self-perception and identity during the hundred years of semi-colonialism and humiliation from the middle 18th centuries to the middle 19th centuries. Okay, so you were talking about the history, but things uh, 1840 and to 1940, China was becoming the bottom of the world was conquered by all this Western power, even by the Portuguese and the little Belgians. Okay. So what identity China has developed through these 100 years of humiliation? Well, you perceive other power the same when it was in the top. Okay. This question they didn't answer. And second is, what has the communism regime changed China's energy since uh, Chairman Mao uh, founding this uh, uh, People's Republic of China, right? So they didn't really talk about the identity change. Uh, so I believe that uh, China's uh, re-rising, okay, it's not the first time rise, it's actually a re-rising, it's a comeback case, that's what I want to say. Uh, it's too complicated to use a single approach to explain. So uh, analytical framework is needed to better account for China's foreign policy behavior during its resurgence. So I, I developed this theory called peaceful internationalism, okay? I argue that China pursued a policy of peaceful internationalism in American-led liberal international order consistent with its national identity. So how, how should I define peaceful internationalism? It's both a, a ideas and a policy aimed at a cross-national framework for cooperation and interchange through non-conflictual, non-hegemonic, and non-unilateral mechanism of dispute resolution. Okay, here you see we share some similarity between my uh, peaceful internationalism and liberal internationalism in terms of the cooperation and interchange, but they have some difference. First, China look for these non-conflictual. Here, the U.S. believe Democratic countries should be mainly peace because we shouldn't fight a war, but we should fight a war with non-democratic countries so we can promote democracy and human rights to other countries. Okay, Then it can be war, but this war is justified. So it's just a war. So we should probably sometime do this war to bring greater peace and prosperity for the world. And the U.S. didn't hesitate to say we want to be a hegemon. Okay? But we are a benign hegemon, okay? So we are using our good powers. But China say we will never want to be a hegemonic positions, okay? And China doesn't believe this unilateralism can uh, dispute this conflict. But the U.S. sometimes believe, well, we can just go our alone, right? If uh, the cooperation fails. So how do I explain China's uh, uh, peaceful internationalism? I use China's identity. 
right? They follow the same analogy of the liberal internationalism. So why the U.S. practice liberal internationalism? It's because the U.S. believe the democracy, right? They believe democratic institutions abroad, uh, domestic, so they want to extend to abroad. Also, they share the value of universality, of democratic value, and respect for human rights. Then they will practice those ideas into uh, extra policy. So why the Chinese should be exception? So I think the Chinese also has their identity. What should I call them? Uh, I named them Phoenix Rising Identity, so from this Phoenix rising from the ash. Okay. Before they were in the top, then in the bottom, then it's the rise again. So there are three periods um, consist uh, to this uh, Phoenix rising identity. One is the Confucian identity shaped by China's glory past from the 700s to 1800s as the dominant state in Asia. Asia. So they have this Confucian identity. And then the second is what I call the victim for identity from the ashes of defeat and decline from the middle 18th centuries to middle 19th. So they were, China was the victim who, okay. The third one is the identity of revolutionary internationalism. So during Mao's era from 1940s to 1970s. Uh, so how do we understand this victim who identity? Well, I will say China will probably bring empathy to the underdogs. That's very contradict to the Western thinking, because the Western thinking followed by Florida, they always believe if we were bullied by others, then we want to bully others when we <laughs> become strong. Right? Called, we are the victim. But the Chinese think differently. They say if we bully by the strong power, when we become the strong power, we don't want to do the same thing to others, a small state, because we suffer, we hurt, we know it's bad, and we don't want to do the same. Right? But we will stand formally against those former imperialism powers. Right? You cannot do this to us again. Right? For instance, China is very informed on this issue with Japan in this uh, territorial dispute. Uh, because you cannot just think you can use the, the gumbo politics on us. So every time the US try to bully China, China will fight uh, affirmatively. Yeah, so you can explain use this victim identity. Um, so I believe all China's identity can prevail only under the stability of the current war system in which the United States is still the dominant powers. So in that sense, China is not trying to overthrow the system because China is a benefactor of the system as well. It brings stabilities and uh, largely is peace and is free trade, free market, China all like this. But the problem is that China wants to amend the system because the current system was set up without China's participation. Right? So now China wants to amend the system right, to bring another voice there. So that's my theory, but are you, maybe you say, oh, this is just something you meant. So is it true? I did three case studies to, uh, uh, to demonstrate my theory. Because of the time constraint, I just briefly talk about this so you can think. That's true. First is this North Korea nuclear crisis since 2003. Okay. So we know North Korea wants to develop a nuclear weapon. Then it seems there will be a conflict between the U.S. and uh, the, the, the Koreans. And then actually George W. Bush invite China to become the broker uh, to start this six-party talk. Think about this. If China thinks like Stalin's Russian, well, China helped the U.S to balance uh, North Korea? Probably not, okay? China probably will use North Korea to balance the U.S., to further weaken the U.S. Or even you don't think as Stalin's Russian, at least you're not going to help the U.S., right? To broke the peace talk. So why China help the U.S. to, to broke the peace talk, right? So my theory can explain that. Second is China's aid foreign policy, uh, sorry, foreign aid policy towards Sub-Saharan Africa. Here always, oh, China go for oil. China go for resources. That's no different from other great powers. So it's new imperialism, a new colonialism there. But China also gave foreign aid to those countries. But China gave foreign aid to every country, no matter you have resource or no resource. Okay. So if you say China go there for resource, why Chinese gave the foreign aid to those countries they don't have any resource there? Right. So my theory can also explain this. 
Third one is China's policy towards uh, the nuclear disarmament policy. So if you're talking about China's prepared for a war with the U.S., then why Chinese are so passionate about start this uh, nuclear disarmament uh, talk with the U.S.? It was actually the U.S. don't want to reduce its <coughs> nuclear weapon, and China only have 200 some nuclear head, but they still say we want to discuss this uh, cut over nuclear capacity. So if you think China is prepared for this war with the U.S., or want to challenge the U.S., why China want to cut its own nuclear weapon but it was the U.S. didn't want to cut. Okay, so if you combine these three, I think uh, you will find the current theory about China have their uh, uh, deficit. So I think it's uh, time for us to think new about the behavior of rising China and use some uh, theory. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I think that sets the, the stage very well sort of to give us a broad context of China's rise in the context of international relations theory. Um, and I'm speaking now because our next speaker is our moderator, and I'm going to introduce her, um, Tina Gerhardt, uh, who is uh, an independent journalist. She's written about climate change negotiations at the United Nations, um, and also about direct action um, protests and so on that have happened outside those protests. Um, she writes about energy policy and climate negotiations and is an expert on energy policy in the U.S. Um, her work has appeared in Alternet, Grist, In These Times, The Progressive, The Nation, and, uh, and most recently also The, the Wall Street Journal. Um, and she's a appeared on Laura Flanders' show on Grit TV um, and also on uh, Pacifica Radio's KPFA, um, Against the Grain, and also Wake Up Call from WBAI here in New York. Um, as well as uh, on National Public Radio. So she is currently a professor um, in the University of Hawaii. So she has flown all the way from Hawaii to be with us today. And are you a little Good jet lagged? It's 6.30 in she's, my world. She's <laughs> like, yeah, but she is powering through this. Um, it's a real honor to be on this panel with Tina. We have co-written a few um, articles before on U.S. and China climate negotiations and uh, the Hu Jintao and Barack Obama Summit last January, we read about that as well. And we actually met in, in, in uh, Cancun for the UN, the COP16, uh, the UN Climate Change Conference down there. So, Tina Gerhardt. <laughs> Thanks, Lucia. <coughs> kind, generous introduction and waking me up. Good morning, world. Yeah, it's, uh, it's Lucia's interest in, ch in China that actually aside from being in Hawaii, has, has really done a lot to bring my focus uh, to the region. Um, and I'm by no means uh, as much of a China scholar as some of my co-panelists. I'll just put that out there right off the bat. Um, I was in uh, Hawaii because I'm assistant professor there uh, during the APEC summit, which took place last fall. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit um, and how it, it ties in with Asia's Pacific century question mark. In November 2011, President Obama and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton made the Pacific region the focus of their foreign policy by hosting the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation APEC Summit in Honolulu, Hawaii. By following the summit with a 10-day Pacific tour, including stops en route by President Obama in Australia and by Clinton in the Philippines and Thailand, and then subsequently by stopping off at the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, and the East Asia Summit in Bali, Indonesia. Well in advance of these visits, Clinton had laid out the importance of, transatlantic, uh, of the transatlantic region for the 21st century in an article that she published in Foreign Policy in October 2011. If you Google search it, you can just come to the PDF, entitled America's Pacific Century. And she gave this uh, article in abbreviated form as a talk at the University of Hawaii the day before the APEC summit kicked off. Um, I had a chance to hear it there. President Obama and Secretary of State Clinton's trip and the attendant economic free trade agreements, as well as the announcement of an increase in 2,500 boots on the ground in Australia, can be read as signs of a major geopolitical shift in Obama's foreign policy. The Asia-Pacific region continues to increase in might. Witness China's offer to bail out the EU last fall, and this is an offer that continues, which I think is a, a really big sign of shifts. And President Obama is well attuned to these geopolitical shifts. Established in 1989 in the face of perceived collapse of communism, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation um, APEC Summit brings together 21 Pacific Rim economies each year seeking to promote free trade in the Asia-Pacific region. For people in the region, the fact that it's rim economies and not basin economies is also very crucial. Together, the 21 member economies account for over half 
uh, 54 to be exact, of global GDP. They account for 58% of U.S. goods consumed and form almost half, 43% of world trade. Seven of the U.S.'s top 15 trade partners are located in the APEC region. So these are all reasons um, for President Obama's focus on the region. <coughs> President Obama seeks to use APEC as a vehicle to establish a free trade agreement or uh, for the Asia-Pacific region. Um, as most of us attending this panel probably know, a wide variety of things get impacted by FTAs. Um, they've been typically detrimental to, to local independent businesses, to farmers, to fishers, and so on. FTAs also trump policies promoting locally grown food, impacting farmers trying to sell their produce and consumers trying to purchase it at farmers markets, um, as well as native plants, seeds, crops. Um, and I, I want to make a tie, and I think left forms a good place to do that, um, between NAFTA, which was ratified under President Bill Clinton in 1994, so that Democrats also are, are seen in their true light as um, being ones that promote um, free trade agreements and neoliberal policies. Um, under NAFTA ratified um, under Bill, Bill Clinton in 1994, Mexico's laws protected things like the traditional mice or corn that had been grown in many regions of Mexico for thousands of years, which then had to submit to NAFTA's terms. As a result, tons of excess U.S. corn saturated the Mexican market, competing with crops of local farmers. Um, one can also think of Monsanto being able to bring in GMO seeds to Mexico and those getting threatening the rich biodiversity of um, Mexico's native seed stock. Other laws that get trumped by FTAs include human rights laws, zoning laws, environmental laws, labor laws, health laws. Um, in Japan, New Zealand, they're very uh, concerned about subsidized medicine. Uh, an FTA in the Pacific region um, would, would, would trump subsidized medicine programs that they currently have in place. This turn to the Pacific region, contrary to what some might believe, is not new for the Obama administration. Um, and President Obama has sought agreements to benefit from the Asia-Pacific region since the uh, very outset of his presidency. Um, a harbinger of things to come, one could read the chorus, the Korea-US Free Trade Agreement, as a sign of, of what, on a bigger scale, the APEC summit um, is trying to implement. On February 10th, 2011, the United States and South Korea signed two agreements uh, that were amendments to the Korea-US Free Trade Agreement, and, and they were ratified on June 30th, 2007. These agreements, which are the most significant the US has signed in over 16 years since NAFTA, and there's that connection between President Clinton's policies and President Obama's um, Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, I think, playing a crucial role there. Um, and, and the sort of neoliberal agendas that the Democratic presidents have been pushing forward through their FTAs. These agreements, the most significant the U.S. has signed in over 16 years since NAFTA, reduced Korean tariffs on U.S. goods exported to Korea. They were approved by Congress on October 12, 2011. On November 23, 2011, the Korean National Assembly ratified the agreement, however, not without considerable opposition as a parliamentarian set off a ga uh, tear gas inside the parliament to protest the decision to bring the FTA to a, to, to a vote with little notice given to parliamentarians in an attempt to squelch dissenting votes. So they just kind of threw it on the agenda without really notifying the parliamentarians. And this week, um, despite the complete lack of any corporate media coverage in the US of this situation in Korea, the widespread protests, because it was just implemented this week, um, this course free trade agreement. Um, they also implemented, they implemented it on March 15th, um, which is a heavily laden day with significance, um, anniversaries, Syrian uprisings, et cetera. But they implemented on March 15th, which is, is interesting, in that free trade agreements typically get implemented on the first of a month because it makes accounting much more easy because all of the math get, you know, anything that has to be calculated, taxes, you know, anything, um, is easier to do on the first of a month than somewhere in the middle of a month. They passed it in the middle of the month because Korea has elections coming up and they're very concerned that the people who are going to be in power in the parliament in Korea are going to be people who are in the majority opposed to the FTA. Um, and this is something the U.S. pushed Korea to do to implement it much earlier. Ron Kirk, U.S. Uh, trade representative, stated that, quote, under the FTA, nearly 95% of bilateral trade in consumer and industrial products will become duty-free within five years, and most remaining tariffs would be eliminated within 10 years, end quote. Additionally, the Chorus Free Trade Agreement would allow greater access to the Korean financial market. Quote, as the first U.S. FTA with a North Asian partner, Kirk continued, the Chorus FTA is a model for free trade agreements for the rest of the region, which is why I bring it in here. 
and underscores the U.S. commitment to an engagement in the Asia-Pacific region, end quote. In other words, the Chorus FT is a harbinger of things to come. Christine Ahn, executive director of the Korea Policy Institute, told me in an interview that, quote, the proposed Chorus FTA undermines South Korean de democracy in significant ways. It undermines, to be precise, approximately 180 South Korean laws, end quote. In particular, she continued, uh, the Chorus FTA has, really, has two really negative effects. First, in the pharmaceutical industry, which I mentioned just a moment ago, and second in the agricultural arena. Chorus has a univer uh, Korea has a universal health care system. While it is not like Sweden's health care system by any means, it does provide basic health care for everyone. And as part of it, Korea has a strong generic pharmaceutical industry. Concerns abound that the Chorus FTA would drive up costs so much that universal health care would be untenable and Korean health care would be essentially privatized. The FTA would also negatively impact agriculture onset as anyone who has followed the World Trade Organization knows Korean farmers have been intensely affected by their policies, end quote. And one could just think here of uh, the 2003 WTO meeting in Cancun where a Korean farmer committed suicide at the barricades um, in order to indicate the desperate situation of Korean farmers as a result of the WTO's policies. Quote, the uh, chorus FTA would deepen this impact on stated according to the Korean government's own figures, 45% of Korean farmers would be displaced from their farms because they would not be able to compete with the U.S. subsidized agricultural industry. We have already seen this type of effect of FTAs in Mexico under NAFTA. Um, Connecting the dots, Australia, U.S. FTA. Uh, like the Chorus FTA, the U.S.-Australia Free Trade Agreement was passed before Obama took office, but augmented during his tenure, and again with the intention to increase free trade in the Pacific region. It was passed uh, January 1, 2005, ratified, uh, sorry, intensified in 2009, when bilateral working groups were established to facilitate agricultural trade. So I read the visit to Australia um, not only as the corporate media represented it as putting more boots on the ground, which it certainly did, but also as an attempt to intensify free trade in the, in the area. Announcing the U.S.-Australia uh, FTA, the Office of U.S. Trade Representative Ron Kirk laid the bare the relationship between these bilateral um, and plan multilateral agreements. And I want to underscore that bilateral agreements um, are taking place more now because of the failure of the WTO, of the, of the Doha round of talks, which a lot of leftists, in my estimation, rightly so, um, claim as a victory for themselves um, in really calling attention to the WTO, protesting consistently its policies at its annual meetings, um, underscoring uh, the negative effects that FTAs um, have have had uh, and continue to have, and that now these agreements can only really be rammed through at a bilateral level, which is not to, to say that there aren't heads of state that are also not participating in multilateral agreements for a variety of reasons. Um, but there is also movement from below um, on the ground in these particular countries that are impacted, as well as sort of an international, um, whatever you want to call it, alter globalization, um, anti-capitalist movement that is, that is working together to make that happen. Um, so the U.S. Uh, trade representative laid bare the relationship between these bilateral and the planned multilateral agreements as it continued, uh, as, as Kirk stated, uh, quote, in September 2008, the United States announced its intention to begin negotiations to join the Trans-Pacific Strategic Economic Partnership Agreement, also known as the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP. Uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. President Obama, during his first visit to Asia in November 2009, underscored his commitment to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, which is a multilateral free trade agreement seeking to liberalize the economies of the Asia-Pacific region, or, quote, to serve as a vehicle for Trans-Pacific economic integration. In a letter sent to Congress on December 14, 2009, Ron Kirk stated that, the pres that President Obama joined the TPP, quote, with the objective of shaping a high standard broad-based regional pact. APEC seeks to pave the way for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is essentially a free trade agreement of the Asia-Pacific region. President Bill Clinton hosted the first APEC summit in 1993, again that lineage a year before NAFTA was passed on Blake's Island and Puget Sound. The proposed TPP thus emerged in the heyday of FTAs, but also out of the stalled uh, WTO Doha talks. Um, ASEAN, the summit that I mentioned previously, uh, initially opposed the establishment of APEC and the TPP, proposing an East Asian Economic Caucus instead, one that notably excluded the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. So there is, 
in my estimation, but I think my co-panelists could probably say a lot more about this, um, in my understanding of it, there is also a, a competition of sorts between ASEAN, if I understand it correctly, and um, this attempt through APEC to establish a trans-Pacific partnership. Again, I could be wrong on that. Um, APEC's members are member economies, they're not nation states, which allows Taiwan to participate as Chinese Taipei. Um, et cetera. There's a couple of other, if one goes through the lists along those lines. Meetings that attempt to employ the Trans-Pacific Partnership have taken place parallel to the APEC Summit since 2002. It was signed in 2005 and implemented in 2006, and it currently includes Brunei, Chile, New Zealand, and Singapore. Australia, Malaysia, Peru, the United States, and Vietnam are negotiating to join, and the first step to formalize the TPP would really, uh, as a regional trade agreement, would be really to set in place some formal architecture for this. And this is something Obama has set um, as a goal for APEC um, to achieve by next year's APEC meeting, which is taking place in Vladivostok, um, Russia, from September 2nd to 9th of 2012. Canada, Japan, and the Philippines, South Korea, and Taiwan have also expressed uh, interest in joining the TPP. And Clinton's subsequent uh, trip to the Philippines, which again had a military component, but I think could also be read as trying to boost some support for them to join the TPP. Uh, let's see, time. Uh, the 1997 economic meltdown in Southeast Asia. Um, so before. Uh, Summit, just before uh, the summit, the APEC summit started, Japan's Prime Minister Noda announced interest in joining the TPP. Um, in response to his decision, 6,000 demonstrators protested in Tokyo, and he was left arriving and sort of backpedaling. And the reason for that is the TPP would deeply impact farmers, especially rice and wheat farmers, um, since it would erase these kinds of tariffs on grains that I mentioned it had already done in, uh, for Mexico allowing Australia, the United States, and Vietnam to import cheaper grains uh, to Japan. Um, and I think one of the things that's playing a role in uh, protests against uh, the TPP or against APEC on the ground and against just FTAs in general, Korea, with these uprisings going on right now, um, is that the, the meltdown of 1997 is really seared into people's minds in the region there. Um, uh, and countries that were most affected by this 1997 Asian financial crisis were Indonesia, South Korea, and Thailand, as well as Japan, Laos, Malaysia, and the Philippines. Um, and, and typical of these kinds of meltdowns, the IMF offered loans. Um, typically, they were tied to um, having to, uh, in, in, in a neoliberal way, realign the economy. There were also um, tariffs were abolished on imports um, as, as this economic reintegration took place. So these are some of the concerns um, that people have about this proposed TPP. In an attempt to drum up support for the TPP, President Obama and Secretary of State uh, Clinton, as I mentioned, moved, uh, traveled on to the East Asia Summit in Bali, Indonesia, which takes place in conjunction with the ASEAN Summit. Uh, the ASEAN Summit consists of 15 nations plus China, South Korea, and Japan. They met uh, in November of last year. India and Australia have also signed on. And this year, Russia and the U.S., I'm sorry, last fall, Russia and the U.S. attended for the first time as observers. ASEAN has already established free trade agreements internal to the zone, so this is why, for, to some extent, I view it as being in competition with the TPP. Um, and then, as I mentioned, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton traveled on to the Philippines, Thailand, and Indonesia. And these are countries that haven't signed on to the TPP yet. Um, she also, uh, sorry, President Obama stopped off en route uh, to Australia, as I mentioned, which is also, um, I think, an, an economic push that he's trying for Australia to, uh, to, to amp up this, uh, this bilateral agreement that we have. Um, I would say attempts to bolster TPP face a much f uh, further and larger hurdle, though, and that brings us back to the focus of the panel. The U.S. wants nations in the region, in particular China, to lower tariffs imposed on, on a variety of products. Um, renewable energy is one of them, and we saw it just this last week, President Obama announcing that the U.S. is going to uh, take a case against China to the World Trade Organization for restricting access to its rare earth minerals. Um, China has about 95% of, of the world's rare earth minerals, and some of them are really vital for things like cell phones or um, electric car batteries. So I think the combination of these visits en route, which established or reaffirmed the U.S.'s military might in the region, um, in order to bolster an economic, uh, bolster its economic interests, have been read from the vantage point of the U.S. as a shift in foreign policy from the Middle East to the Asia-Pacific region. That's the narrative that was told in the media quite often. 
vis-a-vis -vis economic, military, political interests, some argue that reading from the vantage point of nations in the region, it's actually much more of a continuation of a 60 years, uh, standing 60-year uh, post-World War II U.S. policy towards the Asia-Pacific region in general, and China in particular, that completely predates the Obama administration. Thanks for your time. A PhD candidate at the CUNY Graduate Center, and she is working on a dissertation about post World War II US China economic, military, environmental, and political relations. She's also communications director at the Beijing based NGO Innovation Center for Energy and Transportation. Her work has appeared in Alternet, China Dialogue, Grist, Huffington Post, The Nation, and The New York Times. She's been interviewed on Democracy Now!, w, uh, WNYC's. Brian Lehrer's show, Doug Henwood's Behind the News, and This American Life. And her paper today is entitled, U.S.-China Relations, Energy, and Climate Change. Thanks, Tina. Okay. Um, thanks. Well, it's, it's really great to be here today. And as Tina mentioned, I, I wear a number of hats, and primarily two. One is as a student and uh, completing my Ph.D., on U.S.-China relations more broadly, looking at climate change and energy policy as one case study within the broader U.S.-China relations. I'm actually not going to talk about that work today. I'm going to talk instead using my uh, Innovation Center for Energy and Transportation hat. We are an NGO that's based in Beijing, and I have been working with them for the past five years. Uh, the last couple of years I've been here in New York um, since I've been doing this, my, my studies and also working at the same time. Um, and we work on transportation policy and climate change policy um, and, and have done a lot of work bridging the U.S. and China, sort of helping mutual understanding between two countries in the context of the United Nations and the climate change talks, um, first in Copenhagen, Cancun, and then Durban last year, um, and also uh, exchanging best practices, so looking at sort of what policies really work on energy and climate policy and how we can um, implement them in, in both countries in ways that are economically, politically, socially, culturally appropriate for, for each country. Um, so we've done a lot of, a lot of work on that. Um, so I think my, my talk fits in actually really well as I was listening to, to the previous um, panelists. I think I will be talking about U.S.-China relations in the context of um, kind of broader IR theory, although I won't use the same words that Bo used. Um, but still, sort of, the big question is really what, what Bo laid out, is how do we understand China's rise? Um, and China's rise has many different components, uh, one of which is, is the, its I increasing appetite for resources. As it becomes a larger economy, um, it is demanding more resources and more energy, and that creates a competition source of tension with the United States, which is also demanding a lot of resources. Um, and, of course, those that tension surfaces in uh, the area of trade, which is what Tina was talking about, and I'll talk about that a little bit as well. And of course, we have the expert on, on, on resource wars, um, you know, Michael Clare, who wrote a book by that name, and a new book that's on the, the scramble for the resources that are left um, to, to round up the panel in the end. Um, so I am actually not going to be talking about competition for resources. Um, I will be talking about a different type of competition that's related to competition for resources, and that's competition for space in the atmosphere to pollute. So it's a slightly more abstract concept, but I think equally important. Um, and what I mean by that, of course, is greenhouse gas emissions associated with the burning of fossil fuels. Um, we know that there's a finite amount of greenhouse gases that the atmosphere can absorb. And the US and China, as I see it, are competing for, for, for space, for room, for political uh, acceptance, and uh, for permission. In some cases, not asking permission to take up that space. I understand the atmosphere to be sort of um, the ultimate commons. You know, it is, it is something that we all share. The atmosphere ignores national boundaries. You don't have the Chinese part of the atmosphere. You don't have an American part of the atmosphere. You don't have a, Fran a French part of the atmosphere. You just have one atmosphere. And also, it, it functions like a stew, meaning that you know, when you pollute in one area, it can affect parts of the globe that are in the other you know, the other set of the globe. 
Um, and so we really are all in this together. There's a lot of kind of these cliche terms that I think actually are quite appropriate. You know, we are all, we have one word, one earth, and we are all, you know, in this together. This is our problem that we need to share. So we have to get over the political hurdles that Bo mentioned, um, and we have to get over the trade disputes and the issues of competition between the U.S. and China to be able to solve this problem. So that's my mindset in, in looking at this. Um, and I just wanted to make three points, and then um, uh, a, a sort of how I see it from my experience of, of working with China. And again, I, I've been working, I've had the, this great opportunity of working with the Chinese organization. So as I am clearly not Chinese and, and have spent quite a bit of time in China, but still, you know, I, I think that I've had a pretty good experience of working inside the Chinese government and also working with this NGO in China. Um, so that's where, that's where I come from. Um, so first, I'm look, going to look at sort of, you know, these different areas where, where the U.S. and China have, um, you know, potentially different ways of, of viewing the energy and climate crisis. The first is uh, th that the two countries have two opposing models, and this is kind of like their world view, the big picture. Um, the second is how that world view is implemented in practice, and there I'm going to look at the race over clean tech, the development of clean technology, um, and also the trade disputes. And then third, um, I will make an attempt to kind of look at some of the philosophical differences, the ways that the two countries look at the climate energy problems in, in a very different light, as I've seen it, and how sometimes that creates a situation where it's almost like two people who just aren't, they're just not talking in a way that is conducive to cooperation, because they're not understanding, they're looking at different terms. So, so that's kind of a philosophical standpoint, and I'll make a few points about that. Um, okay, so two opposing models. China is uh, run by a communist party. The U.S. is a democracy, we know that. China is run um, primarily by engineers. Most of the top officials in the Politburo are, have engineering degrees. The U.S. is mostly run by lawyers. Um, so there's <laughs> that difference. Um, China is a developing country, which means that although it's becoming increasingly more developed and increasingly more wealthy, um, that, that means that the country sort of has the benefit of not being too entrenched in the fossil fuel economy. Now I say that very carefully because in fact that's changing and it's becoming more and more entrenched. There is, you know, just like the United States, there's becoming a car, automobile and, and oil lobby, you know, that is affecting policies in China, just like we have in the U.S. Um, so alas, this is less and less true, and coal and oil is really dominating both the political scene and also China's international politics. In the U.S., the U.S. is a developed country, and we are very much entrenched in this fossil fuel economy, so it's harder to retract out of that and to make the changes. China has the, the benefit, the opportunity to create a new model. So we have to ask the question, are we seeing that happen? I, I, I'm not sure that we are, but I think there's some elements that we are seeing happening, and that's, that's a good sign. Um, also, China really is forced to deal with the climate change problem more seriously than we are in the United States. There's been incidents of social unrest in China that are associated with land grab and environmental degradation. Um, people are angry. They are showing it on the streets. This is threatening to the government. They need to deal with it. Um, they have more people who live in poverty and are more living more closely to the environment are uh, more vulnerable to weather events and things like that, people living on, you know, in, in shacks on, on the side of riverbeds. Um, in the U.S., we can afford and, in fact, are basically ignoring climate change. The wealthy can buy themselves out of environmental problems. They can build better dikes. They can buy other houses. They can move. And I think, and I would argue, that we have an attitude where the poor, who are more vulnerable to climate change, um, Americans, I believe, have sort of an, uh, this, this cultural view that it's their own fault for not succeeding and not sort of achieving the American dream. So therefore, we're not responsible for the people, the, the victims of Hurricane Katrina, you know, the people who we see are, are, are really uh, vulnerable to, to weather and environmental degradation. So we can ignore it. And in fact, we are. The Republicans, as you know, are launching sort of this war on science and, and really ignoring climate change altogether. China can't afford to do that. Um, in general, the legislative process, you know, another key point of difference in terms of the, the models between the U.S. and China. In, in the U.S., legislation passes, it takes a very long time to pass. But when it does, the implementation is very strong. In China, policies are passed very quickly. 
overnight sometimes. You know, a bunch of people meet in a room, they come out and they're like, this is what we're going to do. But implementation takes a very long time and is often very weak. Um, those, that's a key, key difference. And also in some cases, the data is not good. So if you see a province, um, the official data may be that they've reduced their carbon intensity by X amount. Well, sometimes that's not always the case. Whereas in the US data is, a, is slightly more reliable, at least I've found as a researcher <coughs> working in the two countries. Um, and then the drivers for greenhouse gas emissions are quite different. In China, greenhouse gas emissions are driven primarily by exports, products that China is making for the benefit for sale to other countries. In the US, greenhouse gas emissions is driven by domestic consumption, by large homes, by excessive use of air conditioning, by uh, holiday travel, by large home, by large cars, by diet, um, carbon intensive diets like a lot of meat. China is definitely moving in that direction, but isn't there yet. So those are two ways in which the, the two countries just represent different models. Um, and then how do those models, where, where, do they, where do they sort of hit the road? How do we see those models in practice? Um, and this I'm just going to focus on, the, on clean energy and the race between the U.S. and China um, on, on, on developing clean technology. Tina and I wrote an article called The New Sputnik. I, is that what it was called? Sput the Sputnik moment, which yeah. was a phrase that we stole from um, Secretary Stephen Chu about the U.S. and China's competition, that comparing it to the, the U.S. and USSR competition over um, the space race saying that this is sort of the new frontier, who's going to win. And for a while it really seemed like, like China was winning. Um, China, through many uh, programs of subsidies and government investment, central planning and aggre aggressive government investment, um, has managed to become one of the largest exporters of solar, uh, solar panels and wind turbines. China produced 50% of the world's wind turbines and uh, has 60% of the photovoltaic manufacturing capacity. Um, but about 95% of those solar panels are exported, so China is not implementing them. Um, instead, they're exporting them abroad, but certainly they're becoming the manufacturer of clean technology. But I would argue, um, and then this from the New York Times in 2010, so two years ago, more than three times as much wind power capacity was installed in China than in the United States. So China is really taking leaps and bounds. But then now jump forward a year, 2011, uh, suddenly, U.S. clean energy investments moved back ahead of China for the first time since 2008. Um, this is more recent studies coming out. So, so it is really a horse race. Before, it really looked like China was winning, dominating the clean tech scene. Now the U.S. is coming back. Um, the U.S. has been very unhappy about China's way of getting ahead in the clean technology race, namely uh, issuing subsidies and other material benefits, um, such as massive cash grants, discounted raw material, um, discounted land, power and water, preferential loans, tax exemptions, export assistance grants, and all of those things that can help fledgling renewable energy companies in China do better. Um, and there's been in a, a number of ways in which, a number of incidents when that tension has surfaced. So if one is what Tina mentioned, uh, the, the dispute over rare earth minerals where the U.S. lodged a complaint um, with the Obama administration. Also, um, and just next week we'll hear the verdict on this, um, the, uh, um, I can't remember the name, Sun, a solar pa panel company um, also lodged uh, a, a complaint with the U.S. trade representatives um, that China is unfairly dumping cheap solar panels and uh, messing with the U.S. market. Um, and then in 2010, the Steelworkers Union filed a complaint, again, also with the U.S. Trade Representatives, uh, about wind turbines coming from China. Um, and so again, you know, the, the, the complaints are that, that, that Chinese companies are being unfairly the recipient of, of these subsidies. But in fact, and this is a, a much more detailed argument than I could go into right now, it's something that I've written about and spent a lot of time working on. Many of these measures that we're accusing China of doing, um, many of these subsidies, actually exist in very similar forms in the United States. We do the same thing, basically. Um, and if you're on the side of the earth, if you're on the side of the environment, you have to say that these industries need subsidies. Now, that's my opinion, and I think, and <coughs> Tina and I wrote about this, and this is what we argued, was that basically, um, you know, yes, there is a way in which China's subsidies is, is hurting U.S. solar power, 
but in, in the industry in general, it's helping the industry. It's creating, you know, China is the only country that really has the ability to create green technology on mass scale and make it affordable for not just Americans, but for the developing world, places that are buying this stuff and really need to have it in, in an affordable way right now. Um, again, this is a very complicated debate, and I'll stop there because it gets, I, I think, um, but I just wanted to point out that, that that's the tension, and those are the areas where that tension has sort of ruptured to the surface. Um, one last point that I would point out is that while China is surging ahead as a manufacturer, uh, it's really lagging behind as an owner of intellectual property. One thing, one study that we recently did on uh, electric vehicles showed that China actually owns only 1% of the patents on lithium-ion batteries, which is the key component for electric vehicles. The U.S. owns 22, Japan owns 50. So it's, it's really not a, this world where China is dominating completely. Um, there are trends towards that, but that's not what's happening right now. Also, in terms of actual, I found this interesting, in terms of actual consumption of renewable energy, the U.S. uses, the U.S.'s total electricity, uh, about 3.5% of its total electricity comes from renewable sources. In China, that number is less than 1%. So China isn't really bringing renewable energy online in the way that we might imagine when we hear, uh, you know, China becoming the green tech, you know, um, giant that's sort of taking over the world. That's, that's not quite happening um, right now. And also, an interesting point on electric vehicles, I just wrote a report for the United Nations on this, which found that, yes, China is producing a lot of electric vehicles, and they're taking off, in many ways, not as much as was predicted. There's a lot of scaling back of targets, especially in southern China. Um, but we found that when an electric vehicle is driven in China, because the electric vehicle pulls energy from the grid, and the grid is so heavily dependent on coal, that actually an electric vehicle in, in all but three of the seven provinces in China actually has a higher greenhouse gas footprint than its uh, counterpart in an internal combustion engine vehicle. So you know, that sounds like I'm saying electric vehicles are bad, and I am not. I'm, also, I'm saying that you, know, you need to have the electric vehicle technology, but you also it needs to be paired with uh, smart grid reform, bringing renewable energy into the grid. So uh, we, we wrote that article, we pitched it to the, to the government in China, and um, we'll see what happens. Okay, the last section, to uh, I make an attempt to sort of get at sort of the philosophical differences between um, the U.S. and China in, in, in terms of looking at this energy and climate crisis. Um, China is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world uh, on a nation-state production basis. It overtook the U.S. in 2007, um, many years ahead of predictions, and is, is, could, be, could, could emit twice the amount of emissions as the U.S. does in 2030. So it's, it's this kind of line we're looking at, going way up. Um, but on a historic basis, most of the emissions that are in the atmosphere now um, so I said the atmosphere is like a stew. It's like a stew with a long memory, right? Nothing leaves, so it's, everything stays there. Most of the emissions that are in the atmosphere now are from the US and Europe and their respective industrial revolutions, not from China. Also, on a, on a per capita basis, the US is still a much larger, larger emitter of greenhouse gas emissions than China. Um, and then there's also this tricky question of carbon leakage, which basically is that about a quarter uh, and again, actually, this is old data, and I haven't been able to update it since 2008. But about a in 2008, about a quarter of China's greenhouse gas emissions were directly sourced from products that were made for export. So products that were, were sold to, to Canada, the U.S., and Europe primarily. Um, so with that as sort of, you know, that it, China, when you talk to leaders in China, they, they like to quote these these statistics because it puts it shifts a little bit of the pressure off of the U.S. and onto China, on, off of China and onto the U.S. Um, and and with that as its basis, China has developed this idea that um, that, uh, that that China should be exempted from international uh, regulations, international legally binding targets that are decided upon at the United Nations. So this is something that came up in Copenhagen is a big issue. Uh, at the UN talks there, and then the subsequent UN talks as well. It keeps resurfacing. It's a, it's a really thorny issue. It won't go away. Um, and China believes that the US and China, the developed countries and developing countries, should have common but differentiated responsibilities. This is the, the clause that's actually in the official text of, at the UN, 
Um, and and it, basically what that means is that all countries should respond to the climate crisis, but to 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 their own, you match to with their ability. So developing countries will respond less. Developed countries really need to lead, lead the way. Um, the U.S. rejects this idea and instead uh, believes that a solution needs to have synergy. That's the word that the U.S. officials use, which basically means developing countries need to be doing as much as, we, as the U.S. does. We don't want to act alone. We don't want to stick our neck out. Um, this may hurt our economy, and then it, it'll be, uh, it won't hurt the developing countries, and the U.S. will, will, will lose in competitiveness. Um, uh, and then the other thing is that China is, you know, as a developing country, is still focused on, on poverty. Um, one statistic that I think is interesting is that 480 million people still live uh, in China on less than, a dollar, than, less than $2 a day. Um, so that number is greater than the population of the U.S., the U.K., and Germany combined. So it's really, it's a different country, different priorities, different economic model, um, and, and we have to sort of look at that when... Um, understanding the energy and climate crisis, because of course energy is the essential ingredient to a growing economy. Um, so I don't want to come across as apologizing for, you know, as an apologist for China's behavior, but I think what's what's crucially important is understanding, um, really looking at the details. And I see that, you know, that it, it's sort of woefully lost in, on the U.S. often in the, in the mainstream media and even in the left media, um, where this, you know, the nuance of the trade debate is really lost. Um, and with that, I'll end, because I know that we all want to hear Michael Clare um, talk about our resource competition. So thank you very much. I don't need so, the name. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Thank you. I also want to give people a chance to raise questions. So I'll try to keep to my 15 minutes, so then you'll have some time. That's slow, everyone. And I'm going to examine the new U.S. defense policy, which was first announced uh, in Canberra after the APEC meeting that Tina spoke about on November 17th in a speech by President Obama in the Australian Parliament. And then uh, on January 5th at the Department of Defense at a press conference releasing a new U.S. defense strategy. And this new defense strategy has three main features. The first is that the center of gravity of new U.S., of, of America's strategy will be the Asia-Pacific region, especially the maritime fringe of East Asia, stretching from the Indian Ocean uh, around Southeast Asia, South China Sea, East China Sea, up to Japan with the South China Sea as the pivot, the crucial area. Second, the principal thrust of this refocusing of American strategy will be naval power. It's aimed at what's called in naval terms the command of the sea, dominance of the sea, and use of the sea, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, as a position from which to project power, in military terms, onto the Asian mainland. And third, the geopolitical or strategic aim of this strategy is to encircle China on its maritime flanks, to secure control of the sea lanes, sea lines of communication, or SLOCs, S-L-O-C, sea lines of communication on which China depends for its economic life, for importing raw materials and exporting finished goods, so as to exercise a ultimate veto power over China's economic survival. This strategy will have enormous significance for the future of the world. It's highly dangerous and risky, and I'll come back to that. Uh, but first, let me describe the origins of this strategy briefly. Essentially, it's a response to the strategic dead end of the Bush era strategy loosely called the Global War on Terrorism, or GWAT. But it's essentially, which essentially was a strategy to project American power into the heart of the Middle East and Central Asia. This strategy proved to be monumentally costly, ultimately unsuccessful, strategically insignificant, and a gift to China, which used America's distraction in Central Asia in Afghanistan 
to expand its own reach in Southeast Asia and surrounding waters. Now, U.S. Uh, distraction and, and quagmire wouldn't have been catastrophic for a superpower in its prime with an unlimited supply of gold and troops and treasure and other resources and that certainly was the assumption on which President Bush ordered US forces into Iraq in 2003 but certainly by the end of that period the USA was not was had possessed none of those things anymore its treasury was depleted its military was exhausted and broken, and its strategy and military will was in total disarray. Now, not everybody in Washington will admit to this, uh, this uh, assessment, of course, but President Bush, uh, President Obama, and his advisors are pretty candid about this reality and the current limits to American power. And he talks about this in his speeches, Obama does and on the need for a new strategic vision based on real-world realities, not ideological fantasies. And it appears that last summer or over the past six months or so, they conducted somewhere at, at, at uh, their retreat in Maryland, wherever, a pretty thorough review of America's strategic predicament in this new period and came up with a very clear blueprint for preserving America's global dominance in this new era of diminished wealth and resources and more assertive and powerful challengers. And that blueprint, as I indicated, is focused on Asia and the Pacific, and specifically the use of naval power to dominate the critical sea lanes off the south and east coasts of the Asian mainland. This is seen by the Obama administration as a logical, essential response to the fatal defects of the Bush era strategy. It moves U.S. forces off the ground of Asia where they, and, and onto the sea, where they can be moved around as necessary for short-term contingencies while avoiding costly, dangerous ground operations, and which provoke tremendous hostility from people in the region. It also maximizes America's greatest strategic advantage, which advantages, which are air and naval power, which is also the greatest weakness of potential, uh, potential adversaries, which have strong ground forces, but lack strong air and naval strength. And it also focuses on a kind of a logical strategic construct that the dominant fact of the 21st century is globalization. And globalization rests on the movement of goods on by the sea around the world. And that whoever controls that movement controls the world's economy. And in this, I think, is a much more sellable and sustainable strategy than one based on ideology and an endless war against Muslim fanatics. <laughs> Finally, it gives the U.S. a powerful advantage against America's greatest potential rival, China, in a realm where China is especially vulnerable. That is, its dependency on imported oil and raw materials and, it, and its need to export manufactured goods to world markets, its reliance on globalization. So this is the essence, I think, of the logic behind the new U.S. strategic blueprint. Now those of you who have studied American history and American military policy may be struck by the fact that this is not exactly a new strategic perspective. At the end of the 19th century, you have to go back over 100 years, 120 years to the years before the Spanish-American War when a band of nascent imperialists led by Theodore Roosevelt and Alfred Thayer Mahon, then the president of the Naval War College in New London, Connecticut, not New London, in Newport, Rhode Island, led a campaign to make America a global power, but a specifically a Pacific power. By the annexation of Hawaii, by the defeat of Spain, and the 
uh, the uh, annexation, the, the uh, appropriation of Spain's Pacific colonies, especially the Philippines and other key islands like Guam, and then the domination of the sea lanes of the Western Pacific, including the South China Sea. This was the blueprint of Theodore Roosevelt and Mahan in the 1890s. This led to the despicable U.S. seizure of Hawaii and the conquest of the Philippines against the resistance of the Filipino people, which led to a horrible counterinsurgency war with the use of torture and concentration camps, the Philippine insurgency. Both of these are the subject of new books which have been very well reviewed in the New York Times. I don't have their titles, but they're probably well worth um, reading. And to the acquisition of naval bases throughout the region. And domination of the Western Pacific became the primary aim of US strategy from 1900 up until the 1930s when Japan arose uh, to challenge American dominance in the region. And it was Japan's rise, not Germany's, that provoked American entry into World War II and led uh, to the, the main thrust of American war power was in the Pacific. And it was a very hard war. After World War II, it also, this, this goal of dominating the Western Pacific led to the most deadly and costly war, U.S. wars since World War II in Vietnam and Korea. Uh, there have been distractions of this period, the Soviet buildup in Eastern Europe, and the global war on terror, which, you know, dominated a lot of military thought for about 50 years. But now we're back to the default in U.S. strategy, which is domination of the Western Pacific and reliance on naval power to assert U.S. dominance. But there's a difference, of course, between now and 1930. Once the greatest challenger was Japan, and Japan proved a very formidable foe. We mustn't forget that. Defeating Japan was no easy matter. They fought ferociously for five years. Uh, the, and it, it, with far more limited resources than the U.S. And don't forget it, we used two nuclear weapons to defeat Japan. Today, the U.S. faces a potentially greater challenger than Japan, namely China. China is not an island power, but a mainland power. So it can't be isolated in the same way Japan was. And it has a large population and it's significant domestic natural resources. It also enjoys interior lines of communication to Central Asia, Southeast Asia, and Russia. So it has some advantages that Japan didn't have. Now, so far, China has not espoused any imperial ambitions uh, as Japan once did. And we, 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 we can't we don't know for sure um, what will happen. But China will need to secure control over more and more of the world's vital resources, as, as Lucia suggested. And this will lead to a quasi-imperial Chinese foreign policy uh, willy-nilly, whether acknowledged or not, whether intentional or not. China is becoming a quasi-imperial power in Africa and Central Asia, now in Latin America, in its pursuit of the raw materials it's, it needs. And so it's becoming increasingly dependent on sea lanes to carry the materials that, it's vital, that are vital for its economy <coughs> and becoming dependent on these SLOCs, these slocks. And so U.S. strategists see a struggle to, for control of Asian sea lines of communication as the center of gravity of future geopolitical competition between a rising China and a declining the United States, with the South China Sea as ground zero of this contest. So the South China Sea has now been designated by the U.S. government as the most important strategic place on the planet. Why the South China Sea? We can take, talk more about this uh, if you want me to, but it's an area that's claimed largely by China on the basis of its claim to some islands, the Spratleys and the Paracels. 
But this area is also claimed parts of it by other countries, the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, and so it's a contested area. And China's behavior has been a rather of a bullying nature. It's used naval force against Vietnam and the Philippines and Malaysia, and it has alienated those countries. And this gives the U.S. a strategic advantage, which Obama and Hillary Clinton are seeking to exploit, posing the U.S. as the rescuer of the Southeast Asian Davids in their struggle against the China Chinese Goliath. This is the kind of language they're using in Hawaii at APEC, in Manila when Hillary Clinton was there, in Australia, and using this to acquire bases or reacquire bases in the Philippines, in Singapore, in Australia. We heard about that as well. This was the aim of Obama's trip to, uh, to the region in November also to acquire strategic partners. Now, many of you look like you're of my age, so you'll remember the Vietnam War. It would be inconceivable for me if you told me back then that in 30 or 40 years, the US was gonna be conducting joint military maneuvers with the Vietnamese Navy in a hypothetical war against China. But that's what the US has been doing just this summer. This has very worrisome consequences. Uh, China uh, is uh, clearly, Chinese officials are uh, deeply distressed by this. And if you read the Chinese press, you could see uh, uh, signs of their distress over this. They say the Obama trip and these new moves are causing, are a threat to stability in the region, are warmongering and all of this. It's clearly thrown them off, off their balance, it's exposed vulnerabilities in their regional strategy and made them understandably worried about future U.S. intentions. And this is, uh, has these dangerous consequences China is seeking new allies or bolstering its allies, especially Russia, which is adjacent. So it has interior lines of communication, but Russia is also a major arms supplier to China and a military technology supplier. So China is being moved closer to a quasi-military alliance with Russia. Uh, and they cooperate in Central Asia in a sort of alliance against the U.S. And, and we see this also in, in the international context where China and Russia are cooperating in a kind of an an, building an anti-American quasi-federation of anti-American powers that include Syria and Iran and Venezuela and some of the Central Asian countries. Uh, a blocking U.S. moves at the United Nations around Syria. I find this uh, deeply worrying and distressing. Uh, China is also building up its own navy, understandably, uh, to, uh, re to, ba to balance against the increase in American naval power, building up anti-naval warfare capabilities, submarines and the like. And the Chinese, in conducting these moves, claim that they're defensive, which to the outside observer looking up in space, they're not building up their navy off the California coast. The Americans are building up their capabilities in the South China Sea off the Chinese coast. So when they build up their navy, uh, they view this as a defensive move. Um, but the U.S. views that as a threat to, our, threat to our vital national interest because our vital national interest extends to the coastline of China. Uh, and so when they build up their navy, that's viewed as an offensive move. And this is creating momentum in Washington and the military think tanks and in the right-wing press to say we're not building up the navy fast enough. We have to expand. China's a new threat to American power, the new threat. And so we're moving into a time of, of an incipient naval arms race with China. 
uh, greater suspicion, greater hostility that's developing a momentum of its own. Independent, Obama says that's not what we want. We want to move, we want to have a constructive relationship with China. But when he adopts this strategy, he has pushed us on a path of confrontation and greater risk of, of conflict, of unintended uh, incidents at sea that can escalate. And I, so I fear that the South China Sea is the most dangerous place on the planet because of the risk of in, uh, naval encounters, uh, unintended escalation of, of uh, naval events leading to deeper and deeper uh, hostility and antagonism and suspicion between these two countries leading to conflict. Not because this is intentional, but because of the nature of the clash between America's determination to, 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 to assert its power in this crucial region to contain China, and inevitably China will have to respond, and it's going to set off this chain of events. So, uh, Face, so addressing this matter of naval power is absolutely crucial. So I'll stop there. Plenty of time for good discussion. Um, yeah, I, I want to, uh, you know, to comment on uh, Bo's, you know, viewpoint, and I think it's a very good one. Uh, but I think the China's view, you know, of, of the world. Okay, it's a, it would be a very new one, okay, that I think China is trying to look into their history and the matter of socialism and capitalism, and they're trying to shape a new path, you know, for international relationship, okay, which, is, which would be different, I think, from the general classical view of power and so on and so forth. So, I, I, but, you know, what I am curious is, what is your viewpoint? in terms of with the South China Sea issues, okay? There were a lot of questions that, you know, supposedly China is bull bullying its neighbors. I'm curious, you know, what exactly is the situation? Because on the other side, I hear a lot from the Chinese press that, you know, there are certainly legitimate claims, okay, you know, for those territories, as well as, you know, in East China Sea with Japan, okay? so. And I think, you know, what China is trying to do is to assert its legitimate claim, okay? That is, they're not, you know, if it is legal and if it is according to international precedent that those places belong to China, then they're going to fight for it, okay? On the other hand, if, you know, there are issues, then I think, you know, and I heard something to the effect that China is not willing to submit that to the International Court of Justice. Okay, so I don't know how true that is, you know, since I'm not an expert. Which one the South China Sea? Yeah, South China Sea issue as well as, you know, overall, I think, you know. I think, you know, if China is believed in fairness, okay, they should go to a, a neutral place where there is no imperialistic design and interest, okay, to settle problems. And I think that's the model that China are moving towards, as long as the international platform is not raped, okay, by the imperialist power, okay, and, uh, and I think that really is, is the crux, and, and I would like a comment on that. Okay, yeah, actually, so thank you for the question, because that's what I just want to respond to. Well, so, uh, first, uh, okay, John Mearshire, or he believes Siri is the only thing you can predict in the future. So if you don't have a theory, you can already predict what is the behavior of state. But I, I think I probably agree with him, but also agree history can sometimes predict the future. So uh, use my theory, what was the Chinese response to this American's return to Asia, I think. Uh, recently, the uh, Vice President Xi Jinping, the presumably the next president of China, visited the US. I, I noticed that it's the, the first time the Chinese government made a comment on the uh, U.S. return Asia policy. So he said, I, I think both, so Pacific Asia is broader enough for both China and the U.S. to develop. So this is probably the first time I've heard from the, the Chinese side how they comment on this. So you see the Chinese say, okay, 
yes, we are probably not very happy about this, definitely. But if you make the decision and you, you say you want to return to Asia, then we think it's okay. Right. Then specifically, um, what is China South China Sea policies? I think <clears throat> because also what I say is that it's, it's through a learning process because before probably the um, 1980s, China was excluded from the international society. Right? So China doesn't know how to deal with those uh, issues. So it's also a learning process. You're right, before and we learned when we were at school that the, all the China, South China Sea is people that belong to us. Right? So even that's part of against international law. And since China participated more about this international organization, then they learned this norm of you know, international law, they found it's impossible they claim all this territory dispute. So recently I found the foreign speaker uh, for this foreign ministry. The first time they mentioned China does not intend to claim all this dispute territory in South China Sea. So I think it's a very good start that the, the Chinese government already realized that when we want to be a responsible great power, then we need to follow some norms and rules. I think there are precedent in the in the Burmese negotiation of the territory right. that China did right. give territory right. to, uh, to yes. Burma. Yeah, actually. Okay, to but the, the Chinese was not very happy about the Southeast Asian country that aligned with the U.S. to uh, yeah, exactly. have the U.S. And stand that, behind them. I think China, the yeah, China mm -hmm. preferred this individual bilateral negotiation with individual state. But the U.S. said, you cannot do this because you're going to bully them. <laughs> right. So I think this is the, probably the, the, the problem there. And also you mentioned this China is probably forming this Kwesa alliance with uh, uh, Russia's. So I think, um, you see, in the government officials' documents or towns, they never say China want to align with any other states. Okay. So, uh, and I, I, I think based on my theory, it's true because China was part of this non-alliance movement. They believe a friend because alliance, I think, for the U.S. doesn't mean this uh, equal relationships. So you can't have alliance with Pakistan, so, uh, <laughs> then you can violate their sovereignty and bomb their territory. So, but friends is sometimes you are more equal, no matter you are small or you are strong. Right. So I think formally China don't really uh, form this alliance. But you mentioned this Syria issues. I think that's maybe a very hot topic. I want to just speak briefly is that the reason is China and Russia they oppose this Syrian resolution is different. Because the Russian has military base in Syria, Syria, and they buy this uh, natural gas from Syria. They have tremendous interest there, but not none of this exists for the Chinese case. So why the Chinese against this is because the Chinese feel what they got fooled by the U.S. and the West in these Libya issues, because they they, they actually agreed the UN to uh, intervene to stop this humanitarian crisis, right? But then the, they didn't know once they agreed yeah, is the, the U.S. and the NATO, they bomb uh, Libya over the, the next day, right? So they, they push this regime change. But then the, China, the Chinese learned that if we make this, uh, uh, we, we agree this, then the U.S. Can, and the NATO, they can do this again. So they actually oppose uh, unilateral action, make this regime change. Actually, it's preserving the UN Charter of not inter intervening into ne into member states. Right, right. So I think they, 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 they both feed away, but they have different uh, causes behind this. Right. Uh, approximately two months ago, uh, uh, Samoa changed, or the Samoa government changed the international deadline from, I am going to say, the east to the west to be under the same day as China or Asia. If the Pacific is going to become, a, I am going to say, the main gravitational center in this planet in the next century or whatever, in, do you think this system, uh, and in this case I am talking about the international date line, is going to be totally transformed and change it there to become a, more together to integrate more the Pacific Ocean. Uh, what do you think about it, please? The Americans have a project uh, which which Tina laid out, which is to to call for a Pacific 
um, community of nations which include America's economic allies in Latin America, like Chile in particular, you know, Mexico to some degree, and Peru. So to move the center of gravity of the Pacific towards the United States, uh, China would, of course, look at it differently. Um, and I, I, I think that that U.S. project is kind of a fraud. Because that's not going to happen. The center of gravity is the South China Sea, the East China Sea, and the sea lanes that go from there to Africa and the Middle East. However, you know, there's growing interest in the Arctic <coughs> because as climate change, uh, with, which Lucia spoke about, is going to open up potentially a new route from China through uh, to Europe uh, around Russia. And the Chinese are very, very interested in that sea route opening up. More on that last point, actually, we just recently were given a document that came from the National Development Reform Commission, the agency in China that does planning on these sorts of things. And there's a, a, a map that shows basically the shortened uh, shipping lanes that could be achieved if in, in an iceless Arctic. Um, and, and showing sort of the benefits that, that, that China would experience in terms of saving fuel costs um, by accessing China, uh, San Francisco, also New York, and then also <laughs> Canadian and European markets going right through, you know, down by Greenland. Um, so, it's kind of interesting to see. Back there. Um, in the panel that you were in just before this, there was a great deal of discussion about the possibility of war with Iran. And what happens to this Obama doctrine or project of shifting everything to the Pacific Rim if we are then we, if the government and the state is pulled back again to the Middle East? Okay, well, uh, I mean, Obama doesn't want that to happen. Yeah. So yeah. he's trying to prevent but that from happening. Uh, however, you know, that's the the left flank of this arc, and they talk about an arc, which begins at the Strait of Hormoz in the Persian Gulf, through the Indian Ocean, south of India, through the Strait of Malacca, and the South China Sea, and the East China Sea. This is the area which the U.S. Navy is now, seeks to dominate from one end to the other. So the, the Strait of Hormoz will never disappear as a uh, as, as one of the um, focal points of, of this new strategy. It's, it won't be the center of it. The center is being moved to the South China Sea. They call it the pivot. They have words for this. They speak of a pivot. The pivot is to move it, the center of gravity, from the Persian Gulf to the South China Sea. But it will remain one of the, the, the part, a big part of it. And, and the war with Iran will be a naval air war. It will not be a ground war. So it's not inconsistent with the new emerging strategy. It seems to me there might be also another sort of factor in the dynamic, uh, namely the um, increasing role of other developing countries. For example, um, China last year hosted a meeting of so-called BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And um, I, I think that they at least call for what's known, what, what they call a, a multipolar yeah. globalization. And um, to get away from this two-power confrontation kind of model, and it seems to me that's, that's a good thing because I think it's time for some of these emerging economies and countries to play a greater role in world affairs. Um, and so I'm just wondering, uh, would, would you, would any of the panelists see a, um, a, any, uh, a trend toward more of a role for the other developing countries in, in some of these issues? Or I'm just wondering about, you know, do you see BRICS having a, uh, more of a role or any thoughts about that? Or? Short. I mean, I think BRICS has definitely had an emerging role on the climate and energy scene, um, and that China seems to be favorable to this development. 
moving away from the, the, the idea of a G2, the US and China being sort of like the, 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 the only players on the stage. Um, and I think that that's a good thing. I think with that, there's also been a trend, at least in the climate and, and sort of the politics of climate change and energy, that um, to throw the tacky, the, the, the difficult issue of climate change away from the UN um, to more elite organizations like the, like the G20 um, or, uh, you know, some, sometimes there's even regional organizations that are, are trying to deal with it just because the UN has, has basically failed. So, and I think that's dangerous. So I think going that far is bad because, you know, there needs to be sort of the, the global democracy. All, all countries in the UN is the only place that has sort of that one country, one vote mentality. So I guess there's two different opposing trends there. Well, you know, I'm not really sure which, which direction we're going in, but away from the G20, but not so extreme that, um, you know, this is being dealt with by a handful of countries behind closed doors. I, I, I have to say I've become more pessimistic in the past year. A year or two ago, I would have said that we were moving towards a more multipolar, cooperative world. And, and, you know, if you look at President Obama's speeches in the first two years of his administration, he was a strong supporter of that trend. But he's moved away from that towards a, a, a more bipolar world, or, or rather, I, as I see it, a, a world of two competing quasi-alliance systems, the West versus the, the East, or however you want to put it. Uh, and I, I think that's a combination of the poisonous political atmosphere in Washington, a sense of China's rise being more rapid than anybody anticipated, and that feels threatening. Uh, but a lot of it is domestic, the, whole, the poisonous atmosphere in the United States. Uh, for a whole lot of reasons, uh, I, I, I think, and so this strategy that he's adopted is more about re a, a response to American weakness than anything else. America, it's a way to respond to America's <laughs> decline. But the inevitable result is to push China in a more defensive, threatened uh, environment, which is pushing China, I think, into a more, um, forcing China to seek allies to balance the U.S., and it's leading to these negative consequences, which I think including Ch China-Russia collaboration at the United Nations and Central Asia through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is uh, hardly peaceful or cooperative and in other behaviors as the U.S. also becomes more assertive as well. And, you know, we're sort of in the middle of a transition period and I don't know where all this is going. It may not turn out this way. I don't see the BRICS playing the role that uh, looked more promising a few years ago. Um, I think those groups you mentioned, those countries, I found there are many similarities between China and the India Brazil and uh, South Africa, except for Russia. So uh, I found those countries, they were all post-colonial countries, right? So they share a lot of similarities, same ideas. I remember the first time, the, uh, when the, two years ago, the Brazilian, the China president, the, uh, his first trip was to China, right? And he brought so many business people. One of the aim of the tr uh, trip is to study how the Chinese manage this state-owned enterprise because they were fed up about this Washington consensus asking to privatize everything mm -hmm. but that's wrong. So now we need to learn from the Chinese how to conduct our state-owned economy and gain strength over powers. Mm -hmm. Also India, here you might think, okay, India is the largest democracy in the world and the, the U.S. is really promoting Indian to balance against China. I recently I think in New York Times they published a piece say why India is becoming more like us, right? So they think, but that's really not the case because <laughs> In history, the China and the Indian, they were actually quite close, and uh, they have some dispute, yes, but most, mostly of the case, they were probably now soft by peace, and they can swim this territory. So, so it's really the U.S. want to set up this model in Asia, to say, this is Indian is a model they need to follow, but that's not what the Indians actually want. You see, recently they have this clash between the Indians and the Americans. <coughs> I think also similar happened probably in <coughs> South Africa as well. So, uh, but Russia, I think, exceptional case because in history, uh, I think the Russian choose to join this break uh, is really because it's decline of its powers. So it needs people, country like China and India. But 
I think China and Russia really don't share too much similarities. And, uh, that's my personal opinion. <laughs> You know, uh, you mentioned in your, your talk that China, you know, ha has is more of a possibility of creating a different kind of approach to energy. And um, ten years ago, we lived in China, and I talked to lots of young people and a lot of people about kind of where China was going and what they thought about the pollution, which was evident everywhere. And I was just overwhelmed by the universal desire to have an American lifestyle. That what everybody wanted was to have their own car. China's government at that time was promoting the car industry. And I guess I'm just wondering, I mean it seems like it seemed like such a lost opportunity to develop in a different way. Um, and I'm just wondering if now is there any, where is the pushback? Where is the environmental movement in China, you know, who is promoting a different kind of development, if anybody? Well, I think there's this idea now that, you know, the, the new model is sort of, you can have your cake and eat too, right? So you can, you know, Chinese people can, can yearn for an American style lifestyle and in fact to even have one and have cars, but by using technology, we can use less energy but also live more lavishly, right? Um, and whether or not that's true, I mean, I think basically that's, that's true to a certain degree. It's not completely true. I mean, there are limits. And I think in China, um, you know, the, the different model that China offers is the, the model of central planning and government and, and very aggressive government investment. That is, that's basically the nuts and bolts of, of the alternative model. The U.S., you know, has, hasn't really been able to do that um, for a variety of reasons. Interest groups having a huge influence in politics and so on. Um, but, but that model, you know, in China, even in China, I think is eroding. So while I say that there's an opportunity for a new model, I think that the door is also kind of closing on that as well. Um, you know, but, but that said, I think there is some, some hope for this idea that, you know, that, that, that people can move up the, you know, the, the, have a, a better quality of life um, and also use less energy. And China's understood this as sort of um, setting targets in terms of um, energy intensity per unit of GDP. So continuing to grow, but not as, but not polluting as much as they grow, um, and this kind of, you know, in a way is a little bit tricky because you know the U.S. sets absolute targets: we will reduce our emissions by this much. China says we will reduce it, you know, as a percentage of growth, which is, you know, if this was in, in dieting terms, that's like saying, you know, the, the U.S. is saying I will lose X amount of pounds, China is saying I'm going to have my metabolism be faster. You know, it's not it's not concentrating on the pounds. So. Um, you know, I think uh, I, I think that's kind of what, what what that new model looks like, and I guess we'll have to see sort of how well it can be um, implemented, and in, in if people really can have that lifestyle. Um, and it's not just cars; it's diet and, and travel um, as well. I don't know, maybe the two of you or Tina has something else to say about that. I have a little bit to comment on on, on the comrades. Let me just um, uh, yeah. see if there's other questions just to be inclusive of everyone since you've already, um, sorry, just back there. Um, thank you all because these, these are great updates and analyses on trade agreements on climate. And but this one's from Michael Clare, which is, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the air dimension. Uh, the what? The air dimension. The Pentagon described its new, you know, or, you know current strategy as air sea battle. Yeah. And command of the air is essential if you're going to have naval and power projecting yes. capacity. So couldn't, no, for two reasons. One is couldn't um, the atmosphere be the other hot spot with the South China Sea in an arms race to be able to disable the others, you know, uh, basically command of uh, communications and you know, power projection over the Chinese mainland and over the South China Sea. I mean, those of us who are really concerned about, who are trying to, you know, systematically cut military spending and pull back the power projection, that's the main, you know, expense, uh, see this whole new initiative as, you know, two more generations of expensive weapons development and justification for wars. So we're worried about the air dimension, too. Mm. 
Well, actually, I mean, the, 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 key, the key expression in the new U.S. defense budget and policy goes by the acronym A2AD. Yep. And that stands for, I have to always remember, uh, anti-axis um, area d denial. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it, this is a funny notion to get your head around. They claim that that uh, the big worry, they, the big worry that the U.S. military has is, you know, God forbid that the Chinese want to defend their own territory. They shouldn't be. They shouldn't be allowed to have this capacity or any other, you know, adversary, uh, which 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 means anti-access, that is denying us access to their shore, to their coastal areas, and area denial. That is to deny us access to, to them yeah. for the purpose of invasion and an attack, whether by air or by sea or amphibious landing. So the thrust of the new U.S. strategy, I have it here. I, I'd love to, maybe I'll even read from it. Um, I have it right here. Is the, um, this is the new strategy. You know, it's, they're very clear. Sustaining U.S. global leadership priorities for 21st century defense, and they, they talk about the A, 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 A squared, um, and, and they talk about China uh, as posing a ability to, to, to overcome our ability to attack them. So we have to spend all this money on being able to overcome their defenses uh, abilities. Um, and air power is the, the first wave is you have to shoot down their uh, airplanes, so and then to be able to attack their radars and their anti-ship <coughs> missiles and their anti-aircraft missiles. Of course, these are the same weapons that will be attacked in Iran. And they, they talk about China and Iran. States such as China and Iran will continue to pursue asymmetric means, like submarines, to counter our power projection capabilities, our ability to, to assault them, while the proliferation of sophisticated weapons, etc. Accordingly, the U.S. military will invest as required to ensure its ability to op operate effectively in anti-access and area denial environments. This is what we're spending our tax dollars on, is to be able to invade other countries, <laughs> even in the face of their desire to defend themselves. So that's what this is all about. And it's a, you know, it's a 20th, 19th century form of military dominance and aggressiveness, and it's, uh, I think it's despicable. That's the bottom line of imperialism. Yeah, whatever. Could dominance. you cite the reference for that article? This is not an article. This is the policy of our government. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's called Sustaining U.S. Global Leadership Priorities for 21st Century Defense. U.S. Department of Defense, January uh, 2012, and it begins with a letter from the White House signed by Barack Obama, <laughs> giving his endorsement. Um, we're at time. We've, we've already run over 10 minutes. I warmly welcome you to join to join to continue the conversation afterwards. Um, thank you so much for coming out. Thanks for the great discussion. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you.